Hello, it's Philip Taylor from Richmond Green Chambers speaking. I'm talking about an interesting book, which is an area that I'm involved in. It's about public law, and public law is a particularly important area for everybody today. I come from a background as a counsellor and as, as a person who's been involved in judicial review matters, and this book I find very helpful. It's called Judicial Remedies in Public Law. It's the fourth edition by Clive Lewis, Queen's Counsel, published by Sweet and Maxwell. You can see it's very much like the Sweet and Maxwell publications. It's got the standard cases at the front, some very useful, uh, useful uh, paragraph numbers. And then towards the end, you've got obviously uh, substantial footnotes and a useful detailed in index right at the end. It's about 700 odd pages long. It's not that complex. Uh, the writing style is different from some of the other styles that I'm used to. I'll come on to that in a minute. What I've done is I've put this review on the internet. It'll be published elsewhere too. And I've said keeping an eye on public bodies because that is very much in tune with the human rights stuff that we've, we've got at the moment and what we're looking at with the new green paper. And I've then given it a subtitle, Public Law Remedies, a modern legal phenomenon with ancient legal roots. And I'll explain that because obviously that comes from a comment that's made about the book. What the work does is it focuses on public law and the judicial remedies available to ensure its proper application. It's summarised by um, Mr Lewis, Queen's Counsel, by saying public law concerns the principles governing the activities of public bodies and those performing public functions. And he adds that claims for judicial review remain the primary method of determining and enforcing those public law principles, as well as statutory appeals and applications and habeas corpus. Obviously, we will have our own favourites with uh, earlier editions, but this is a very modern edition, and very much in keeping with what's happening at the moment. So the fourth edition of this work covers the practice and procedure involved of relevant remedies that are sought by, by particular parties. And it provides practical advice and guidance through the options at each stage in 16 detailed chapters ending suitably with the European Court. Can I just make it clear that many people misunderstand JR. They haven't really got an idea. And it's often a big problem because money is always the source of irritation for many. However, put that to one side because the title incorporates, in my view, all the major legislative developments we have, including principles of important case law, and it gives advice on damages available under tort, contract, restitution and statutory compensation. And it evidences an impressive breadth of approach, as for instance in Chapter 2, which reveals and deals with the scope of judicial review, including for the first time a full examination of the common law powers of the Crown, controversial to some. By Chapter 9, we've got to the machinery of judicial review itself. And in the words of Lord Justice Laws, who I've referred to earlier, he says, it's a vague mechum through the nuts and bolts of judicial review, which contains a wealth of practical guidance, including new and or expanded sections on costs, where permission is refused, protective costs, orders and disclosure. As I said before, the costs element's always a problem. Because like the dreaded client, I want my day in court. Well, it's a very costly business. Moving on from that, of prime importance, I think, in the book is the description and analysis of remedies available under EU law and the extensive examination of, of course, the Human Rights Act, which rightly permeates throughout the whole of the book and exerts such a profound influence, a far-reaching one, of course, on modern life until we get the next bit of legislation, which will be after 2010. We've now got the Green Paper on bills of, um, of the Bill of human rights and responsibilities and we'll see where that takes us. Obviously that's for the next edition. Let's get back to the fourth edition. In particular, says Lewis, this book is concerned with the avenues by which decisions of public bodies 
may be challenged before the higher courts. Very sensitive subject, of course, with the objectors and who may well be your clients. Obviously, he's looking rather with than with challenges before the inferior courts or tribunals, which tend to be of a lower sort of degree of irritant, if I can put it that way. Uh, also, he's having stated earlier that the courts have developed a body of substantive principles of public law to ensure that public bodies do not exceed or abuse their powers and that they perform their duties. That is the area, obviously it's well explained, but that's an area of high controversy because a lot of people don't think they are or they want it done in a different way. And it's an area that the, perhaps with Sustainable Communities Act and other legislation, we may well have to start looking at this again. So let me conclude by saying it's an authoritative commentary which inevitably helps a practitioner build a stronger case. And as Law's remarks from the experience of recent history, it's a thoroughly modern work as befits a jurisdiction whose constitutional place, though it has ancient legal roots, is a modern legal phenomenon. And that's where it comes from, right at the beginning. I believe it's a great supplement to the original work I used in 1964, uh, 1974, rather, which still haunts me. That's Judicial Review of Administrative Action. We've come a long way in 35 years. The particular written approach of De Smith isn't here in this book. To me, it's, that's a little bit that's missing, but I love the book. Uh, but De Smith was a particular favourite of mine. Um, but there's going to be more to follow. And this is the current one that we have. So thank you very much, Clive Lewis. Bye-bye.